a really great segue into this pretty abhorrent and also not that surprising article from Bloomberg that sort of touches upon a lot of this stuff that I'm just struggling to really understand in the wake of everything that's been going on. So this is courtesy of Bloomberg. It says, we must start planning for a permanent pandemic. The subtitle says, with coronavirus mutations pitted against vaccinations in global arms race, we may never go back to normal. Like written by Andreas Kluf. And the first thing that comes to mind is what's wrong with these journalists, right? What is up with these journalists who are just obsessed and committed to um, writing up the most doom laden um, articles that they can muster in the wake of, you know, things maybe going back to normal in some reasonable time frame? Why are they so hell bent on making sure that they currently keep reminding us that things could get worse before they get better at every single turn, despite every medical advancement, right? The fact that, despite the fact that we've even got a vaccine in the first place, which is again a marvel of medicine that we've been able to kind of run it through, speed it through the process, maybe not jumped over some hoops in terms of regulation, but we've been able to kind of develop it produce it right put it into circulation at this level in order to get the world back functioning as it should be and people are still hell-bent on reminding you that no 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 not so fast you should still be at home things should still be locked down like what is it and the only thing that can come away thinking from it is that some of these people just genuinely uh, do enjoy living in this state of misery they've kind of no i wouldn't say they kind of got some comfort from it and it's macabre to say this, but it definitely does ring true when you think of that quote from, was it Walden? Yeah, Henry David Faroo, right? Most men live lives of quiet desperation. This definitely kind of speaks to it, where there is some comfort in the idea that everybody is suffering the same as you are, or to the same extent. We're all kind of going through this collective um you know situation where regardless of how rich you may be or access you do have you're not living life to the extent that you're living in 2019 you're still living it with some limits right with some um limits your freedom and your movement whatever it may be you're not kind of living life to the level that you were living it which then can kind of illustrates your level of access wealth wealth, wealth malarkey, blah, blah 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 so this is kind of the great equalizer in some respects right because we're all going through it at the same time in real time obviously to varying levels but it's essentially affecting everybody the same sort of way in a way right generally so maybe it's kind of brings people like andreas kluf some level of uh relief that this is happening because generally their lives day to day are miserable so when everyone else is miserable it makes them happy maybe that's it or maybe they're just generally scared about going back into the real world which again makes you think so why should if just because you're scared why should you have the right to make me scared when i don't want to be and why is there this constant need to just write up these pieces where it's like if you try to be optimistic and try to look at the world a bit more you know glass half full and try to think of all the things that could change for the better and all the great things to look forward to when we get back into living our normal lives you'll be met with some level of resistance that you're being a covid denier or you're anti-vax or something it's just a, such a bizarre place that we're in at the moment so let's read a bit about the article and we continue it says here for the past year an assumption sometimes explicit often tacit has informed almost all our thinking about the pandemic at some point it will be over and then we'll go back to quote unquote back to normal this premise is almost certainly wrong SARS-CoV-2 protein and elusive as it is may become the permanent enemy like the flu but worse and even if it prefers uh, even if it petters out eventually our lives and routines will by then change irreversibly going quote unquote back to normal won't be an option the only way is forward but to what exactly just like what is that like what relief and what kind of hope is that meant to bring to anybody but hey we continue most epidemics disappear once protect, once a population achieve herd immunity and the pathogen has few or vulnerable bodies available to host it for its um, self proper propagation this herd protection comes about through the combination of natural immunity in people who have recovered from infection with, with vaccinations of the remaining population in the case of SARS-CoV-2 however recent developments suggest that we may never have achieved herd immunity even in the US which leads most other countries in vaccinations and already had one large outbreak won't get there 
That's the upshot of the analysis by Christopher Murray of the University of Washington and Peter Piot of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. The main reason is the ongoing emergence of the new variants that behave much like almost like new viruses and the, the clinical vaccine trial in South Africa showed that people in the placebo group had to previously be infected with the one strain had no immunity against the mutated descendant um, and became reinfected. There are similar reports from parts of Brazil that had massive outbreaks and subsequently suffered renewed epidemics. We knew this was going to be the case, though. No one was under the assumption that just because everyone got vaccinated, there wasn't going to be mutations of the virus. But we're willing to take the risk. As with all things in life, there's going to be some risk involved with just deciding to open things up again once we re once we achieve some level of immunization. So the argument against that would just be like, what? We have to wait for everything to currently disappear until it goes back to normal economies couldn't survive this person's job couldn't survive but then maybe that's the case maybe these journalists are so kind of insulated from the consequences of living in the real world right because essentially to be a journalist especially nowadays you don't really need to have you know you don't need to be in one permanent location you're essentially just doing it all from the comfort of your laptop or pc um you can do it remotely anywhere in the world um you can write for a number of publications all at the same time um especially with platforms like Substack and stuff it kind of takes you out of the need to kind of be you know um in the rat race competing for bylines and editorials and columns and stuff whatever it may be but you'd assume with some of that level of maneuverability flexibility and options to kind of do what you want with your career that they'd be a little bit more hopeful about the future but no nah, instead in their ivory towers sip sitting you know sipping on expensive coffee and eating you know and you know avocado on toast and sourdough bread or something they're chastising us for the need f for our desire to return back to quote unquote normal when we have no option really right in a world where regular working class people have no other option but to return to normal because that's the only way they're going to put food on the table they're telling you that no you shouldn't go back outdoors because there's these mutant variations of the virus that are kind of developing out there in the urethra that we should be afraid of um, it continues um, that leaves only vaccinations as a path towards herd immunity and admittedly some of the shots available today are still somewhat effective against some of the new variants but over time they will become powerless against the other coming mutations of course vaccine makers are already feverishly working on making new jabs in particular inoculations based on the revolutionary mnra technology i previously described can be updated faster than any vaccine history but the serum still needs to be made shipped distributed and jabbed and the process hasn't happened fast enough nor covered the planet wildly enough um yes yeah, some of us some of us may win in a regional round or two against the virus by vaccinating one particular population as israel has done for instance but evolution doesn't care where it does where it does its work and the virus replicates whenever it finds warm unvaccinated bodies with cells that let it reproduce its rna as it copies itself it makes occasional coding mistakes and some of the chances errors turn into other mutations the viral uh, avatars are popping up whenever there's a lot of transmission going on and somebody bothers to look closely a British, a South African, and at least one Brazilian strain are already become notorious. But I've also seen reports of viral cousins and nephews showing up in California, Oregon, and elsewhere. If we were if we were to sequence samples in more places, we'd probably find more relatives. Again, more scaremongering. It continues. We should therefore assume that the virus is already mutating fast in many poor countries that have so far received no jabs at all, even if their youthful populations keep mortality manageable, thus masking the severity of the local outbreaks last month antonio guerres of the secretary general of the united states nation of the united nations sorry reminded the world that 75 percent of all shots had been administered to just 10 countries while 130 countries hadn't primed a single syringe again this is stuff that's way beyond most of our pay grades way beyond most of our political jurisdiction um things that are affecting people in poor parts of the world third world countries that are inherently corrupt um, riddled with all sorts of controversies day to day right that we have absolutely no knowledge of or influence on so again i don't see what the point is of that but we continue a pathogen's evolution is neither surprising nor automatically worrisome one frequent pattern is that bugs 
over time become more contagious but less virulent after all not killing your host too efficiently confirms an advantage in natural selection if SARS-CoV-2 goes this route it'll eventually become just another common cold but that's not what has been done recently the variants we know have become more infectious but not less lethal from the epidemiological point of view what's the worst news that's the worst news so Again, a very macabre and somber negative way to sort of look at things, which is kind of understandable considering it's coming from a journalist who isn't going to be affected uh, by the, you know, by the lockdown in any way, shape or form. Their future or their lifestyles are probably going to remain the same and they have the luxury of doing so. Most people, average people like me and you have to kind of interact and get back to living a quasi normal life and i just think in general with things improving with vaccinations and stuff and you know rates going down especially with deaths there is some optimism to kind of highlight and to remind people about to kind of give them some level of hope because i think i don't know it depends who's reading these things if it's just the average consumer if it's just people within the sort of media world then it doesn't matter but if you're writing this sort of thing in effort to reach general average everyday people then i would think that there's some responsibility to provide them with some good news with some morsel of optimism to look forward to especially considering how bleak things were last year you want to provide them with some level of hope right that things will get better um sooner rather than later instead of kind of reminding them of how bleak the situation is and how badly it could turn at a moment's notice because we're all aware of that but we just choose not to kind of constantly live our lives reminding ourselves of the fact that we're going to die at any moment in, in time i think that we're all kind of aware of our more you know our mortality we're all aware of how insignificant we are in the you know in the grand scheme of things but we try to do the best with the time that we have available to make the most of the little time that we do have available on this planet constantly be reminded that of our mortality just isn't helpful in any way shape or form especially considering that we've been pummeled in, especially in parts of western europe um with covid uh, parts of our governments have dealt with it catastrophically badly right um it would be nice just to have the media you know the mainstream media especially use those opportunity to maybe you know call to account the politicians and also provide some good news and some hope for people that are watching it regular citizens like you and i but you know maybe i'm asking for too much maybe i'm asking for too much